people always ask like what do you think the chances are of there actually being life there you're listening to the cosmic cast Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cosmic Cast, brought to you by the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. Your your usual hosts today, it's me, Marissa Lowe, joined by Tom Harvey. Hello. Ricky Bahir. Hi. John Pernay Fisher. Hello. And our special guest today is Rachel Hamp from the Open University. Hello. Hello, Rachel. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, doing pretty good. Um, how how's your week going? How is lockdown going for you? It's yeah, it's going okay. I'm happy it's Friday, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but it's it's been actually a very good week, a very productive week. So those are those are rare. They are precious. That's good. <laughs> they are yeah. precious. They are precious indeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Rachel, you're studying Enceladus for your PhD project, which I believe is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. For anyone who doesn't know. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, what do you do your PhD project on? So I am looking at how the subsurface ocean on Enceladus interacts with the rock. So for those of you that don't know, Enceladus is uh, it's one of the mid-sized moons of Saturn, and it essentially is ice on the way all the way around the outside, and then there's a global subsurface ocean underneath, and then a rock core right in the centre. So I look at how the water and the rock interact with each other underneath that ice crust Um, and what's seriously cool about this moon is that on the south pole there's actually cracks in the ice crust where the water in the subsurface ocean is then thrown out into space and the Cassini spacecraft has analyzed that water so what's really cool is the work that I'm doing even though it's like under like kilometers worth of ice and normally you wouldn't be able to sample it because that water is thrown out into space uh, we've managed to get data from that so I can actually compare what I do like to actual data that we've managed to collect from like the moon itself. That's really cool yeah so these these are Enceladus plumes aren't they they're quite spectacular images aren't they I might, I might try they and are throw very one up now on screen. Um, so what, what kind of data was collected then how, I mean, how much how much do we know about uh, about the ocean? So the data that's been collected it's quite uh, it's been very complicated for the team that are kind of trying to decipher it um so what we know so far that is that it is predominantly water Mm. and it is the key uh other molecules we've got we've got uh, sodium chloride potassium chloride sodium carbonates um and then there's also kind of like silicon nanoparticles in the plumes and what's really cool that they've just kind of in the last few years managed to work out is um some larger organics and Mm. some smaller organics. Um, So my project is actually specifically trying to define a carbon cycle. So I'm really interested in those organics and what's happening in like the carbon cycle um, and kind of like the size that they're getting to um, or whether or not they're just kind of like all small like hydrocarbons or if they're actually growing into like cool organics that, you know, could mean something for life. Um, yeah that sounds really awesome so are you doing like some lab work and some modeling yeah so uh my projects uh is kind of split into these three sections um so actually what i did to start with is i designed a simulant to represent the rock Mm. in the center of enceladus um and i've run some modeling work where i've tried to recreate the chemistry that we think could be the subsurface ocean chemistry um, but I've done that from kind of like uh, working on a hypothetical starting Enceladus mm. and then working forward to today and then analyzing that to the Cassini data to kind of work out if we're like I'm along the right lines with where I've gone mm. and then the third and final part is I'm making that ocean chemistry in the lab and that simulant that I've made and uh, at the Open University we've got these PAR reactors, which are essentially like these high pressure, high temperature simulation reactors. And I'm going to put the two of them together and heat them up and put them at the right pressure for the ocean floor and Enceladus um, and basically track the changes to the rock and track the changes to the ocean chemistry and hopefully see so what, cool. what's going on. That's, so how, how big is this ocean on Enceladus then? Is it quite deep then, I guess? Yeah, it, it varies 
um, depending on where you are on the moon. Mm. So the South Pole, you have the deepest part of the ocean and you're probably looking at about 40 kilometers. Mm. Um, and if you're actually to go around about the equator, you're, it's only about 20 to 30 kilometers thick. Okay. So that's really deep then, I guess, just for context, I'm just trying to, trying to think what the deepest point is on the Earth's ocean. How deep is the Marianas Trench? Does anyone know? What, 10 kilometres? Yeah, I I'm thought it's sure. on that sort of order as well, isn't it? Could look that up quickly, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but that's really cool. I don't think we've, we've definitely not had anyone on the Cosmic Cast talking about Enceladus before. Mm. Um, how do they think Enceladus formed or where, where did it come from? You know, like you said, at the start of the model, you have to sort of have this as the starting point. What information do you use for that? Um, so that is a, that's a good question. And it is a mystery. <laughs> um, so what I based it on is that the, uh, the, I based the ocean chemistry on a comet, um, on cometary ice. So there's so many different possibilities of how Enceladus could have been formed, but it's kind of, I think one of the kind of most agreed upon things is that there's a good chance that you had like the silicate rock forming and then potentially over time it was bombarded with comets, it's been hit with comets and everything and it slowly kind of acquired uh, like an icy crust along the outside mm. and then when you've had the uh, radioactive like uh, elements or anything in the rock that kind of decay as they have kind of warmed up and it's kind of melted the bit of the ice that's around the rock and that's potentially how Enceladus was first formed mm. and now you have kind of um, like tides and everything that's kind of keeping and maintaining the subsurface ocean and kind of hydrothermal uh, reactions going on. Um, okay. So the rock itself in the centre is thought to be similar to a carbonaceous chondrite mm -hmm. in kind of like composition. Um, yeah. So I've kind of based it on a comet, comet ice reacting with a carbonaceous chondrite meteorite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, for the icy shell, that's kind of like it's crust on the outside. You said that um, oh, oh, like as it's going through space, it'll experience some tidal forces on it. Is that where those cracks have come from then or is that something from something else? So the cracks, how they formed, I am not sure. Um, not entirely sure anyone's sure. So what's quite cool about them is they actually, so there's four like big fractures along the ice and then within there, there's kind of like so many little jets that come out but if you're to actually like just watch them it's like they come on and off at different times mm. um so there's there's no um there's no like system to it though um so it looks as though it could kind of just be like fractures in the ice that kind of like are exposed to space and then like it you know you get a jet that comes out and then it all kind of like condenses and like shuts again and then the pressure will build up and you'll get it refracturing yeah that's really strange because I suppose one of the analogies that can be drawn is sort of, you know, uh, volcanic eruptions on Earth, but at least they seem to have a bit more rhyme and reason for, oh, the magma's over here, the crack will open here, the magma's over here, it'll do this. Mm. So Yeah, so on the, uh, they're all on Sorry. the South Pole on Enceladus, and it's the South Pole, the region where, um, so on average, the, like, there's a massive uh, temperature difference between the South Pole and everywhere else. So it's a lot warmer. So okay. it's thought that where the rock and the water meet, there's kind of like hydrothermal vents potentially on the ocean floor. But I mean, that's still a good 40 kilometers from when you actually hit any ice. Um, so it's, there's still so many unanswered questions about what's going on in Enceladus. Is, which... is it a function of the thickness of the ice in those different areas as well? Is the, uh, is the ice thinner in the South? It's mass massively thinner yeah. in the south. Mm. Um, and again, whether or not that's, you know, it's kind of like what came first. Was it the mm. hydrothermalness on, in the water and the warm water that's caused the thinning of the ice, which is called the fractures? Mm. Or has something happened, I don't know, that's just caused the ice and then led to something happening underneath in the ocean? Um, and do we have any idea how long these fractures have been releasing water into the space for? because it would imply that 
the ocean beneath the surface may have had a larger volume of water at one point if it's been steadily losing it to space. Yeah, so um, the earring uh, of Saturn is actually thought to be composed of everything that uh, has been thrown out of the plumes oh. with enough escape velocity to then be held in orbit. Mm. Um, Seriously cool. Yeah. It is, it is very, mm. So it is very mm. cool. Um, but what you'll also find is that most of the material though will deposit back onto the surface of Enceladus. Mm. Um, so it's really hard to know how long the, how long the plumes have been active. Um, some people think they're relatively new um, because there's kind of like most of it being ejected then deposited back on. And because Enceladus orbits in the E-ring, everything it does eventually does make it to the E-ring, it will slowly be kind of like scooped up onto its own surface. Um, but there is a theory, um, the proto-Enceladus theory, that does essentially suggest this, that Enceladus at one point was significantly larger than it is now and that it how like it must have lost a proportion of its mass um through th throwing stuff out into space but i mean that's one of many theories so if it, it's a complete guess as to how long they've been active but active long enough where if you've managed to get this uh earring forming around saturn kind of made up of that material do we have an idea of what um the interface, I mean, I guess you've sort of described this a little bit already, if there's like hydrothermal systems. What, what is that interface between the, the rocky core and the water at the bottom of the ocean like? Because I was trying to think, like, is that like on top of a kind of mid-oceanic ridge on Earth in terms of temperature and pressure, which is kind of, otherwise we don't really have that. So... On the South Pole, so all of my studies looking at the, the cool, mm. interesting part on the South Pole. Um, it's, yeah, it's kind of, you know, the mid-Atlantic ridge is kind of thought to be fairly similar. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there, there's a, a group of uh, researchers that determine that the temperature where the rock interacts with the water needs to be a minimum of 90 degrees centigrade in some of these areas on the ocean floor um, due to the silica nanoparticles that they found in the plumes and the size of them. Um, and basically they've backtracked and based on the size of them, it kind of, the, you need a minimum of 90 degrees centigrade to kind of like kick um, the formation of these particles. Um, so just sort of eroding silica off the, off the bedrock effectively. Uh, so it's kind of thought, well, it's not that thought, but my work is uh, actually taking a turn into looking at this, um, that they're kind of formed in an aqueous, um, so aqueous silica is kind of formed and then they kind of amorphous silicate precipitates out as that hydrothermal wow. fluid on the ocean floor uh, causes its moves towards the ice, ice ocean interface. Oh, that's cool. Is that just because of the pressure then that we see that there in other places? or Mainly like the temperature difference. Mm. Um, the pressure on Enceladus doesn't seem to make too much of a difference what my models would suggest, but it might be a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah. So well, does that rocky core have a metal core inside it? It's not commonly thought to. There are still right. some people that are working on the theory that it could, um, but the overall density of Enceladus uh, has been measured or you know calculated through mm the Cassini observations and it's, it's unlikely. Um, so the density of the rocky material itself is surprisingly light. So it's thought that it's probably quite a porous structure. Um, and there's been some groups that kind of hypothesize that it could be like a rubble pile structure rather than like a fully consolidated body. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there's so many unanswered questions. Mm, yeah. Um, so you said the first part of your PhD project is looking at sort of the core material of Enceladus mm. and you mentioned um, some lab work where you've been making a simulant. Um, so yeah, would you mind explaining what that is and how do you go about making fake rock? <laughs> uh, 
Um, it sounds a lot more glamorous than it is. <laughs> um, so there's very limited data, obviously, on what the rock on Enceladus is like, because it's, you know, you've got the ice, the water, and then finally the rock. Mm. Um, so based on the observations that we've got from the plumes, you kind of have to work backwards. Mm. Um, so we know we found carbon and there was molecular hydrogen that's been detected in the plumes. Um, and because of the silica particles that have been detected, and based on other things like the density and all the different chemical species, the nitrogen species and everything that's been detected, um, it's kind of commonly thought to be a bit like a carbonaceous chondrite. Mm -hmm. um, so with the molecular hydrogen, it's kind of thought you could have serpentinization reactions happening on the ocean floor. So things like olivine going through to serpentine, which released this hydrogen that we've seen. Um, so I basically, loads of scientists thought it was a, probably a carbonaceous chondrite and I made the decision that it could probably be most like a CI carbonaceous chondrite, which is just the most aquously altered one of them. Um, so obviously the water and the rock on Enceladus have probably been interacting for who knows how many years. Um, so I've just kind of taken the assumption that the minerals that are in the rock are probably quite aquously altered. Mm -hmm. um, so what I actually did was just, I went through so much literature and found so many compositions of different CI chondrites that have been reported. And I took about 10 sets of data and I just averaged them and said, this is a chemistry for an average CI chondrite and then looked at realistic minerals that have been detected in chondrites before and then try and like piece it together to get a list of minerals and then went out and bought them and basically just spent a long time crushing up individual minerals and then mixing them together in a certain ratio and in a lab somewhere I just have a box of crushed up minerals <laughs> <laughs> sitting there waiting for me to uh, get back into the lab to do some experiments with. <laughs> Yeah. So, so what, what is the plan with those simulants? Um, so I'm planning on reacting it with the ocean chemistry that I've mm. defined. Um, and I'm actually running some experiments with organics and some experiments without organics mm -hmm. um, to look at the difference and how much, um, what happens to the different organics. But mm. mainly I will just, I've obviously, I know what the rock is when I've put it in. And I know what the ocean chemistry is when I put it in. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to react these for about three weeks with each other. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, I will analyze the ocean composition again and reanalyze the composition of the rock and just see how they've changed over time and try and piece that together as to what reactions have probably happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to sample ocean chemistry periodically throughout those three weeks and hopefully then be able to get an idea of kind of like the rate of reactions and if we've reached any form of equilibrium or anything in the time scale that we've been going, or if actually what I've done is a tiny little snapshot as you know, as to what's going on, but I've, I've powdered the rock to try and force it to be a, a bit, a lot quicker than it's going to be in real life. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool that you can do that in a lab. I mean, mm. can you do, is it just quite small volumes then when you do this lab work or can you get it's quite very small volume? Yeah. Well, um, I have a hundred, milliliter reactor chamber <laughs> um so yeah you're looking at probably like 30 grams of rock yeah. and maybe 50 mil of fluid or something okay well that's, that's still quite large i guess compared to some of the other sort of high pressure vessels that are yeah, about, it's, I suppose, isn't it? it's not too bad you just have to account for the expansion when you heat it up <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> otherwise uh yeah <laughs> yes ocean water everywhere i suppose uh, no, that's really cool then. So has lockdown affected some of these plans then? It, sadly, it has. Um, so I was actually in the process of like, you know, about to get into those hardcore experiments in March. Um, so I sadly haven't managed to get quite back in yet to get them set up. So we're getting there slowly. Yeah. Um, so I've actually, uh, I found some more interesting results in my modelling work. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm now running uh, extra models where actually as I'm running ex uh, models on after the rock has interacted with the water, what happens as it cools, as it moves from the ocean floor up 
to the ice ocean interface. Um, and then I'm also going to run some models which show how, what happens when that will freeze as it goes through the ice cracks and out into space. So it will mean that the results from my initial modeling work that I did are going to be more comparable to the data collected by the Cassini spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So it's not been a complete waste of time. It's just put a different spin on my project. So rather than a whole project dominantly, like purely focused on trying to define a carbon cycle, I'm now just kind of more general sense looking at the geochemistry yeah. of the subsurface environment, which it's fine. I quite like modeling work. Um, and I've got to learn a new model, um, mm -hmm. which is all, all exciting. It's all fun things. So, yeah. That's a lovely positive spin to put on lockdown. I'm like, you know, yeah. it's, when you, I feel as though when you enter your 40, you've got to try and be positive about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you mind talking through what kind of models these are? So I'm guessing they're sort of more to do with the chemistry. Of yeah. So the ocean. I, predominantly use this software that's called CHIM XPT. Uh, it is a thermochemical modeling software which specializes in uh, aqueous solid interactions. Um, yeah. So it's perfect for yeah. what I do. It's not, I don't think it's, it's not overly common, um, but it is basically designed by the guy who does very similar things to this. And one of my supervisors, uh, actually we have quite frequent contact with a guy who made the software through her, which is great because when you have problems, you are emailing the person that created the software and just going, I do got, got a slight problem and I can't get this to work. And he's more than happy just to be like, Oh, send me over your start script and I'll take a look for you. That's great. Um, so it's, re it's really good. Yeah. Um, so I've used that for the, the water rock interactions and I've run that for the cooling of the fluid. And I'm about to start using freeze cam for the freezing of the fluid afterwards. Cool. So are these custom built for Enceladus or are they sort of adapted for, for, for what people use on Earth for instance to understand these processes? So I've adapted it for what I need for Enceladus. So um, they have hard? been used for, it's not too hard because it's mainly, it's the variable, it has such a large repository of things that you can put in. Hmm. Um, and it's got a really wide temperature and pressure um, spectrum. Hmm. So it's, really, it's been really, really easy to adapt to what I need. Um, it's been used quite a lot for Martian studies, actually. Hmm. Um, well, that's what my supervisor and all of the papers that I've currently read, trying to understand the program initially, were all uh, looking at aqueous alteration uh, on Mars. So are you taking the ideas of the origin of Enceladus sort of forward modeling to see what, how you would get the present day Enceladus based on what we know from Cassini data? Just yeah. Checking all that yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So there's been a lot of the work so far that's been done has been looking at the Cassini data and working backwards um, okay. and going, cool, if we see all of this in the plumes, how does that translate into what's mm. in the ocean now? Mm. Um, and that's, you know, been well done. And because I needed to make a simulant that you have to kind of think about, well, what was it then to start with? And so I've kind of gone with the, the other end approach, kind of like the bottom up approach rather than like the top down approach as to mm. what was it like when a, what was, could it have been originally? And then gone forward just to what we can see today and then compare that to the Cassini data. Um, mm. luckily for me, it's matched up quite nicely. So <laughs> that's ah, good. That's yeah. great. That's going to be my next yeah. question. Um, yeah. I've actually compared it. What, uh, Mark Fox Powell, a guy in our research group has done the top down approach mm. and we've sat down and we compared our results to each other and they were all within like, you know, the same order of magnitude, this very similar ballpark. And we were like, well, that, that's, that's got to be a good sign. And hopefully mm. neither of us have gone too drastically wrong. <laughs> mm. That's great. What sort of things were you comparing? So mainly just the, uh, the concentration of sort of the different chemical species that we've got. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, it might be good actually to take a second and just sort of backtrack a bit and just sort of um, uh, ask a bit about why Enceladus is so important, I guess. And I suppose 
these sorts of ocean worlds have got a lot of implications potentially finding life, haven't they? Yeah, so I personally obviously feel that Enceladus is the most important. Mm. Um, <laughs> I feel like I have to say that. We'll get all, um, uh, all the angry comments from the Europa crowd and in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so Enceladus has has these hydrotherm, this hydrothermal region on the ocean floor. So as we were saying earlier, it's kind of similar to what you know we could find on Earth, like hydrothermal vents on Earth. Yeah. And obviously that is one of the possible theories as to where life could have originated from on Earth. Yeah. Uh, in the plumes of Enceladus, we've detected nitrogen, molecular hydrogen, carbon species, or like, and quite now a range of organics. Mm. Um, all of these things that are kind of needed by life, required, and they're all there. Mm -hmm. So there's no, I mean, we haven't detected sulfur and phosphorus, which are like the other key bioessential elements. Um, but obviously, there's a whole global sub surface ocean so it's actually quite a lot of water mm. um so i would say it's i don't know people always ask like what do you think the chances are of there actually being life there mm. um and i'm not sure because yeah. it's you have no idea of the age of enceladus and how long there could have been a liquid water on it and then how long these reactions could be going yeah but in theory there's you know there's everything there that means it, you know, yeah. it, it could be there. So that's what I find really interesting about it anyway. Yeah. I mean, so I guess sort of reframe that question a bit then. So do you think if we were to try and start somewhere in the solar system to find life, Enceladus or one of the other ocean moons would be the place to start rather than somewhere like Mars? So I would go oh, for Sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> no offence, Ricky. No, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I would go with a one of the ocean worlds. Yeah. Um, so sorry, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> to the so audience I think, there, that's I think, I think you I dropped out there. I don't know what you said. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I would go with one of the ocean worlds. Um, yeah. So we know more about Enceladus, mm -hmm. um, which is why currently I would say, you know, we know most about it, therefore it's, you know, we can say that it's poten potential is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's it. I didn't realise that actually. So we don't know as much about Europa and other places, I guess. We don't at all. So yeah. Europa in some ways is, if it's similar to Enceladus and it's got this rock water interaction mm. and potential hydrothermal vents, mm. it would probably shift Europa into being more likely because it's bigger. Yeah. And it's probably older. And if those two things are true, especially if it's bigger, because Enceladus, is, it's only... 500 kilometers in diameter oh wow that's tiny then wow. yeah, yeah so if you yeah. look at europa which is i think a similar size to our moon right um you just have a lot more there's a lot more possibility mm -hmm. for kind yeah. of like life to start whereas if it's on yeah. such a small scale it's it's less likely so yeah. enceladus's size and potential yeah. uh youngness is probably the, the main limitations that's interesting yeah because I, I kind of feel like in the sort of popular media you hear more about europa and its oceans than you do enceladus is that i don't know is that the impression that everyone else gets i feel like the images of enceladus's mm, full of plumes, plumes. Are yeah shared quite a lot they're quite iconic mm. i guess yeah. yeah i feel sorry go on uh, at conferences and i see world sessions there's been a massive shift even during the ex like the length of my phd from mm. enceladus through to europa mm. but i think that's mainly you know cassini's been and gone and they're still going through the last like some of the data that they've got but it's kind of like new data is only coming out every now and then but yeah. with europa we've got europa clipper and juice which is gonna uh fly by i think a few times or yeah. So I think there's definitely becoming a shift yeah. where I imagine in after Europa Clipper and things have gone, we'll know so much more about Europa that it will probably way overtake Enceladus. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'd forgotten about, I'd forgotten about Europa Clipper. What, what, what was, um, what's that mission doing again? I, I can't remember now. That's, um... I'm not entirely sure. I've tried to uh, 
not sad on myself, but <laughs> thinking that it's going to overtake and sell it us. Don't don't give them the hits. Don't give the no. comments. Yeah. No, good yeah. stress fair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So there's, there's nothing planned for Enceladus um, in the near future then, in terms no, of missions? There's, there's been a few missions that have kind of been proposed kind of in the background, but there's nothing that's going to be taken up. And sadly, I don't think anytime soon mm. there'll be anything that will go to Enceladus. Okay, that's a shame. Yeah, I think, well, they kind of need better... I think they kind of, once they've managed to set up instruments that will be good for flying through the plumes, yeah. um, that are kind of specifically designed for that, then maybe we'll be able to get there. But I think there's kind of like a shift across to Europa. Yeah. Um, and I guess in terms of like looking at the plumes of Enceladus and stuff, I guess it's just too far away to do any like Earth-based observations or anything. Yeah, there's not, there's not that much data we can collect from yeah. on Earth. It's, yeah. But still, it's amazing how much information you've gotten from the Cassini flybys. Yes, I mean, it was luck, really, in some sense, that when Cassini set off, like, no one knew there were plumes on Enceladus to be studied. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and because the mission was extended quite a few times, they did manage to fly through the plumes. It was obviously never part of the original um, kind of mission plan. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, so if, if a mission was to go back with instruments specifically designed for flying through plumes, yeah. it would be incredible because obviously uh, the instruments on Cassini, kind of they maxed out at kind of like 100 or 200 atomic units. So as soon as you have anything that's like a bigger molecule, it just or couldn't complex. detect yeah. it. Um, and obviously it wasn't set up for actually flying through some molecules and particles that were being thrown out into space with so much power that... <laughs> okay. That's cool. So in fact, we don't really know the, the true range of all the complex organics that might be there then. No. So um, the only way that they've actually kind of managed to piece together the fact that there probably are these larger organics yeah. is that as there was a, most of the times Cassini kind of tried to fly through the plumes quite slowly mm. to obviously try and collect as much data as possible. Yeah. And there was a couple of these flybys where they actually went through the plumes fairly fast mm -hmm. and it's in those faster flybys where they've gone through the plumes they've managed to collect they've suddenly got a much wider set of data kind mm -hmm. of above 70 atomic units and it's because you have these larger organics that at a slow speed basically if this was your detector it's just kind of hitting it and bouncing off mm -hmm. and it's taken something to hit it to break it up and then it can be detected because now it's below the 200 mm. atomic mm. units. Mm. Um, so at the, at the slower speeds, it was hitting it, but it couldn't detect it because it was above the 200 yeah. atomic yeah. unit limit. Um, That's really cool. That's very clever. So are, are these organics thought to come from um, sort of cometary ice or is it thought to come from the sort of carbonaceous core? Uh, I think, on the whole, it's kind of thought to come from the carbonaceous core. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so there is a, a paper that's come out a couple of years ago that kind of pieces it all back together. Um, and in the end, the one thing that it most likely compares it to is something along the lines of humic acid. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, yeah, that's brilliant. So, so I guess this has got really quite fundamental implications for understanding life on Earth as well then, I suppose. And understanding where all these different constituents come from and how they interact in the solar system. Yeah, it's definitely uh, it's definitely become a lot bigger than I originally thought it would, and mm. have wider implications than just like, oh, I'm going to look at a carbon cycle between some rock and some water. And the more that I've done it, when you're trying to piece together the origin of Enceladus and the hydrothermal vents and the potential for life on that, and comparing it to on Earth, and yeah, yeah it's definitely spiraled into like a bigger like breadth of knowledge to kind of like consider than I anticipated. Yeah. That's so, so cool. So can I ask, uh, what was it that drew you to studying Enceladus for a PhD? So I had never really considered studying Enceladus. Mm -hmm. um, I'd kind of ruled out doing a PhD and I um, 
not stumbled upon it. That's, that's definitely the wrong phrasing. But I, so I did an internship when I was an undergrad at the Open University and I looked at the, I worked with a PhD student that was currently here and at ways to detect organics in meteorites mm. using different fluorescent techniques. Um, and it was kind of, I've always been interested in space and everything related to it, but at no point had I ever considered working in it. I was like hardcore chemistry. I was quite, quite happy with my hardcore chemistry. And then I was quite happy with doing like atmospheric chemistry was kind of where I was at the end of my master's. And I did this internship at the OU and I was just like, wow, who would ever thought you could combine something that you love to read about and you're interested in with work? And for some reason, it never struck me that you could do this. Um, and it was great. I did this internship and loved it. And I finished, my, I finished my master's and I was like, oh, shall I apply for a PhD? And I kind of went, actually, I think I'm done. I think, I think I'm done. And I went and worked as an analytical chemist. And I was there for about two months. And I went, I'm not done. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think it took me kind of deciding not to do it and leaving it which made me realize how much I wanted to do it mm -hmm. and I was like every job that I looked for was just like research 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 and then when it came down to deciding what to do um I actually emailed uh Vic Pearson who is currently my supervisor um but she's the lady who was the supervisor of the PhD student that I'd done my internship with and just been like hey like do you remember me <laughs> um kind of interested and she goes well it's funny you say that like I've actually got you know a PhD that I kind of I wrote and as I was writing it I thought you would be a good person to mm. do it oh, um it's amazing so and as soon as I read it I was like yes and I, like the more background research I did into it I was just like this this is what I want to do and the more that I've done it uh the more I've kind of been so grateful for the fact that it kind of, it was kind of like the perfect timing um, in the PhD being offered and obviously having met Vic through my internship that it kind of allowed me to kind of get to where I am now, um, which was really great because mm. I'm not sure what else I'd rather study now. Mm. Aww. Great answer. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I'll get bonus points with Vic there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shout out to Vic. <laughs> I mean, it was so nice that Vic said to you, um, you, I was thinking of you as I was writing this, that you'd be the perfect candidate for it. My, my PhD supervisor still says I wasn't the right person for it and I've already <laughs> finished it. So. <laughs> yeah, well, in the, so the description of what you, like who was required for it, it was definitely like, you needed to have like a geologist, geochemist person with an interest in kind of like microbiology. Um, hmm. And Vic was like, or a chemist. I definitely could have a chemist. <laughs> and she was just like, yeah. It, it was really nice when she said she, like, mm. she wrote it with me, with like the idea of someone like me in mind of take, like doing the project. Mm. Um, and she had two on offer. And she was like, these are the two that I've got. And she was like, but this one is, <laughs> yeah, is the one I'd recommend for you. <laughs> did, did it just say geologist, geochemist, chemist, or Rachel Hamp? <laughs> <laughs> Two months analytical chemist experience required. <laughs> Not quite, but you know. <laughs> we always hate to ask the question of, uh, do you have anything, you know, you're planning to do after your PhD or have you not got that far? Yeah. So I have a plan. Okay. Um, I have a plan of a project that I would like to do. Um, and I have proposed it to a few people at the OU, mm -hmm. if they would be interested in helping me find some money to do it. Um, so hopefully, that's carrying on further Enceladus research. Um, hopefully that comes off, but it, you know, it's one of those things that I, I would like to do, but who knows if it'll happen. But I'm definitely looking, trying to find a geochemistry postdoc, ideally staying in the icy moon region but I am not against geochemistry on other planetary bodies so <laughs> you know I guess I can look at aqueous alteration on Mars but... 
<laughs> well, we hope that works out for you. And uh, in the, I guess, the absence of that working out, this question is what we ask everyone else. Um, and this is the final question. Um, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what is it that you'd, you'd wish you could do as a career? Oh. Um, so how I kind of thought my life would turn out would be something to do with sport. Um, so I was pretty convinced that I was probably going to end up being a PE teacher mm. um, or a squash coach. Um, was kind of when I was, you know, 16, 17, and I played every sport that was possible under the sun. I kind of naturally assumed that my life would kind of go down doing something in sport um, or being some form of teacher, really. Fair enough. Oh. Yeah, you, you still keep up with quite a few sporty things during your PhD, don't you? Yeah, so I still play. Uh, I play squash fairly competitively mm. and then I run and I yeah enter races and mm -hmm. play casual football for our astrobiology football team that's pretty Aww. cool has it been quite tough not being able to do much yeah. like squash over lockdown and stuff then it has it definitely has been tough um i've missed i kind of a lot a lot of doing sport for me is kind of like relaxing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if i've had a stressful day um it's definitely really really helpful to go and hit a ball against a wall really hard for a bit um and the, the squash courts at the OU are actually only about a five minute walk from my desk so you can easily pop out at lunchtime play a game for half an hour mm. and get back to your desk and you know you've been gone for less than an hour um and I found it I have found it quite hard not having not being able to do that so I have done a lot of running mm. at the start I must admit, it's kind of slacked off recently. Um, but I do these really cool outdoor boot camps. I say really cool. Everyone else looks at me as though I'm crazy. Um, outdoor boot camps, which actually I did last night. And they're great. Um, and because they're outdoors, um, they were one of the first things that were allowed to kind of kick back up after mm. lockdown eased a bit. Are these these military style ones where they force you to run around and do lots of exercises and jumping around and stuff? So it's, ours is not military style, but it is running around outside. And kind of yesterday I came back and I was like, there was quite a lot of mud on me. <laughs> I was, the dog didn't know what to do. It started licking my knees, just like, <laughs> um, But they're great fun. And it's mainly about being outside and being with a big group of people and kind of like all of you going, we know we look a bit ridiculous, but it's entertaining when you're with a group of people all feeling the same. Yeah. Mm. That's how we feel about this podcast. You've summed <laughs> it up. <laughs> we may look rather silly, but we all look rather silly. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I think we should just say thank you very much for coming on. Yeah. Great it's job. been an absolute well, thank, pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yes, no, absolutely. And I hope you, you're able to get back into the lab soon as well and uh, to carry on with some of your cool sounding experiments. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, once you've you. finished up, we'll definitely have to have you on again mm. to hear how it all went. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And of course, Rachel, thanks very much uh, once again. Uh, and to all you in the audience, thank you all for watching uh, or listening, of course. Um, if you want more Earth and Solar System content, of course, we're evenly distributed across various social media <laughs> platforms from Facebook to Instagram to Twitter. Uh, and why not check out our blog? Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I hope you all have a lovely week and we'll see you all next time for another episode of the Cosmic Cast. Goodbye. Bye.